So first, let's kind of break this piece into chunks horizontally and vertically. So time-wise, there's three sections. Starting on one, we have three, one, four, one, five. So I'm just going to play the first couple measures of each section where we hear that. So the first section opens in the key of D. Kind of rushing through it, but... Second section, we change keys, but we're going to open with this nice F chord. And then finally for the last section, we're going to return to the key of D with D as the drone. And there's going to be a little more motion in the, I guess, the tenor register. Look at the vertical structure of the piece. Um, in the first section, we have kind of three things going on. We have the melody, the pi notes, three, one, four, one, five, nine, two, six. So also in the right hand is going to be the drone note, and we'll dig more into that. And then in the left hand, in this first section, we have mostly simple notes, um, open fifths, a lot of open fifths, some sixths, not anything too complicated. So those are the three things going on vertically. In the second section, we're going to start to see also some kind of counter melody, some tenor melody in this range. So, and this might get picked up by either hand in the opening of the second section. Um, we see it move to the right hand. But it's really in the third section that we really have four things going on. We have the pi melody, the drone, and a much stronger counter melody in addition to the chords moving in the bass. So in the third section, let's look at those slices. and third part have D as the drone and you're going to have this repeating note um, and there's a little asterisk here which I'll explain in a moment uh, and then the middle section is going to have C as the drone and this has kind of the same same asterisk so a drone note typically might be played on an instrument where it's kind of playing constantly, some instrument where you don't need to like hit it percussively again and again, but you might need to decide where to breathe. So I want you to think of the drone note as being something that's continued and where you're looking for good spots to take a breath and play it again, but in a way where it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like you're hitting this note, it just is this background note. And so because of that, uh, when you perform this piece, you have a lot of leeway as to when you actually hit this drone note, or in the middle of the piece, this drone note. So the first measure, um, as written, might sound like this. But if you wanted to play it a little slower, then you might need to take more breaths to repeat and keep this drone note sustained. Uh, for example, like this. I want to avoid playing it at the same time as another note. 
because that might turn it into a harmony of the other note instead of this drone that kind of lives its own life. So here's what not to do. There's a couple special times where the drone note is going to detach itself from its detached droneliness and then reattach to the, the melody. So what I'm paying attention to as I practice this first part is that I'm holding this drone through. Everyone's supposed to be holding it through. So in the first measure that's like this. I don't let it go until I'm already, I got my pedal down again, I'm ready to play the next note. And then and I'm listening, I'm making sure I can hear this note as part of these changing chords. So this is especially important there, right? One way to get used to hearing this note is to run through this section, I'm gonna run through this section and play everything kind of as chords. So now I'm gonna play it again, but this time more as written, and see if I can still feel as if this note is part of hitting each chord, even though I'm not initiating it, I'm holding it through. Don't let up until this last note of the first section. Something I like about that exercise is that uh, you can work on bringing out different notes. Like if I play all the notes evenly, but what if as I repeat this, I try bringing out different notes? part of the piece I often like to use a soft pedal um, depending on your piano uh, whether you have a soft pedal what kind of soft pedal it is um, I like to use it kind of in the first section of the piece and then only open up at the end of the first section of the piece so um, on my piano it's gonna shift all the keys over it's got a little bit of a squeak which is why I'm not gonna do too much soft pedal work um, 
I might usually bring the soft pedal in and out a little more frequently, but I don't want that squeak messing up my performance, so I'm gonna use it sparingly. Uh, I need to get that fixed, but I'm tuned to pandemic temperament. It's been a while since I've been able to get a tech out here, so we have the squeak to deal with. And that's just one more element where we have to figure out in our performance, where can I get away with having that little squeak? And where might I forego the soft pedal because I um, don't want that sound in my performance. Okay, the final thing I want to say about this first section of the piece is that not all notes of the melody are equal. This melody, because it is so disjointed, it's basically random notes. Let's look at the melody. to get used to it after you've played this piece a bunch. Let's move on to the second section. There's a bunch of points in this piece where you're going to want to take kind of um, bass clef notes in your right hand. We do have this inner voice here, so... So the second section we want to start paying more attention to things other than this melody. We've heard this melody before, but now it has different harmonies. So it's still important, but we're going to bring out a little bit more from the left hand or from the, the bass clef. So we can start that with this kind of inner voice here. We don't want to go too hard, but we can if we want. I'm going to go a little extra hard bringing up this middle voice um, when I play it uh, for demonstration purposes. opportunity to bring out this moving line in the bass. Often in this piece you'll have a note that kind of an octave of something that gets picked up or brought down from one to the other. I'm not going to bring down this melody because I need this note as part of my chord. So I'm going to keep this note and just kind of touch on this one to bring this up an octave. To this. So I'm going to lead to this note from two directions. I'm going to come down to it from this melody note. And I'm also going to lead up to it from below. And forgive my... forgive me for not being able to get a tuner um, before filming this, but oh, I struggle. So I don't know if this is exactly proper notation. But when I do kind of a tied note that also has an accent on it, um, on piano, once, once a note is down, you can never <laughs> play it louder as you're holding it. If you were playing kind of a tied note with an accent on a stringed instrument, then as you're sustaining it, you can uh, emphasize it. You can bring in an accent at the end of a held note. On piano, you can't actually do that. So you might wonder, what do I mean? I think I do this a couple times in this piece. Um, I could have done a couple more, but where I do that, and here's where I, I am thinking this note so hard that in my first performance in my Pi Day video, I did accidentally play it again for real. But what I want to do is think playing it again, and I want to hear playing it again. And I want to like still hear it. And I'm also coming at it from below. The 
third section starts exactly like the first. Except, then this note, instead of being just part of the harmony, it gets a life of its own. Here we're holding it. Now remember how important it is to hold these notes over their ties. going on and fourths depending on how you think of them can be um, they can feel strong and powerful they can also feel dissonant and really jarring the fourth is a really interesting interval um, unlike the fifth the fifth is 100% consonant and it's when you play a fifth it becomes one thing uh, it's not two notes right It's, it, the two notes are so similar as far as physics go, right? The way the strings vibrate, the actual math behind it, the physics behind it makes a open fifth. Um, those two notes kind of become one thing. Whereas a fourth, it's the inversion of a fifth. Right, here's a fifth. We bring this up an octave, we have a fourth. And yet, the physics no longer line up in quite the same way. So you get these two notes that in some ways feel like they could be this strong unit, but on the other hand, they don't physically mesh together in the same way, and it becomes dissonant, it, it like kind of pops out. And so there's a lot of fourths in this piece that we really want to hear, especially where we're making a fourth by holding on to an earlier note that we're sustaining. Um, so I'll give an example uh, as we go through the beginning of the piece. So we're going to keep on holding on to this note over every bar line. We're still holding it, and then this fourth. Right? If we play this as chords, we can kind of really make that pop. So let's, let's play this opening as chords. as if we're playing it, but we don't even need to play this note. We can sustain it from the previous measure. Practicing with like repeated chords can help really feel that relationship between these two notes. part is really simple. We just kind of hop it around to different. Another thing you can practice is making it slower and um, just considering this drone to really be a drone that's going to just gently, subtly be in the background. Another way to practice this first section is hardly ever play this note. Um, it's a drone, you don't need to hit it again and again as long as it's sustaining if you don't want to. If you want to play it as much as you need to, you can play it as written if you want to play it as written. Um, but you can also try hitting it as little as possible.
for the third section where there's three things going on in the right hand. One way to start is to forget the drone and just to practice the outer parts of the right hand. I find it can be helpful to have that anchor there to move my other notes around. Um, so you can also just keep it held down don't worry about playing it again and again, and then practice your outer bits. Right, oh, hold, practice holding that over, you know? I'm gonna try and exaggerate my pedaling here so um, you can see how I'm holding these notes. So, pedal down. Holding that drone. you can do that I don't like because I like exercises that sound good but if I really need to I will try playing without the pedal depending on how much you want to repeat the drone you might do a, a silent finger switch um, here So playing piano is so much more than just pressing the note at the right time and at the right kind of velocity and everything. You also need to make sure you follow through and hold the notes the right amount of time. And when you've got lots of ties going on and lots of phrases and motion and voices going on, uh, it, can, it can become quite a brain teaser or a hand teaser to hold on to all the notes you're supposed to hold on to while you're also playing new notes. So here's a measure we're going to go in holding these and then... first trying to get this piece smooth this is a measure that I had to drill over and over again and I'll kind of show you how I go about that because I enjoy drilling a measure and playing it in different ways and just really getting into it so that it's getting into my fingers but also um, I'm shaping it and learning how I might shape it different ways it's I don't know if it looks hard but getting this in your brain that you're really holding these is it's it's puzzling we need, we just need to hear all four of these notes even though they're not initiated at the same time. So I'm gonna just play this as chords for a moment. Or perhaps even I'm just going to drill that and the actual thing.
hard. The big question for me when it comes to expression is what notes am I going to hold on to and include in the rest of... <laughs> what do I hold on to and what do I let go? It's an important question, not just for um, performance and expression, but also expression in your own life. So one other question you might have is... How much do I hold these together, right? I could have them kind of really this muddy kind of trill, like... So here I'm really holding on to all of these. Um, which is a, it's a style, it's a way to do it. Um, you don't really need to because you have these notes up here too. So sometimes you can let go of them down here um, because you still have that note. You're not going to miss any part of the harmony if you don't hold it. Instead it will just maybe make it a little darker or muddier, which maybe you want. So I'm going to play with how much I um, let go of these bottom notes. So here I'm going to pedal each one. one up here. I don't need this D twice, do I? Maybe I do. the piano, not the problem, but one of the things about the piano is that once I hit a note, I can't crescendo, right? There's no, there's no crescendoing. There's only one way I like to kind of smooth out my crescendos and my phrasing is I might start by playing it with a lot of repeats and then I'll take away all the extra notes, but keep the feeling of the crescendo. So, um, let me try it again, repeating it all together.
about this measure where some people may not be able to reach this tenth. Um, now, if you think you can't reach that tenth, I can't reach a pure tenth. My hand is not big enough, um, even if I stretch. So I can reach this by, because these notes are first, I can sneak in from the side and catch it at the edge. And I do this by, um, I kind of push in so that I can get my hand to stretch a little further than I might be able to do it if I were not pushing against something. I mean, don't hurt yourself here, but... This way I can hold this note. But if you can't do that, then you have my permission to do this alternative. You can let go of this note and then play it again along with the D. a soft pedal before I go into this next one. Another one you might not be able to reach. And here, this is supposed to be like a muddy section. So if you can't reach this, here's a part where you can just kind of hold down the pedal and end. As long as you've got these by the end held down. One final note, this last chord, it's supposed to be as soft as you can play it. On some pianos, you um, will not be able to do this, but the way I do this on my piano, um, when you press a key uh, very softly, there's like a natural little resting point, and then from there you can hit it again. It's basically that if you press slowly, um, the hammer only goes to a certain point before it's, it's triggered to do a sudden hit. And this is so that on a grand piano, you can never um, mechanically kind of force the hammer to rest on the string. You don't want to have it so that when you're holding a note down, that means the hammer is getting held onto the string because that would mute the string, right? You want it to do a, a little hit and you want how you play to change how fast or how hard that hit is or how close to the string it is. So as I press down, the hammer gets closer and closer to the string but I can't go so far down that the hammer is just gonna like rest and press up against the string. So I reach this kind of resting point where the hammer is cl very close to the string and then I can get just the tiniest, quietest little note possible. Um, and the reason I like to play this like this is so that I can make sure all four notes are gonna hit very quietly and very even evenly. If I were trying to play a really soft chord with four different notes like this. If I were trying to play it as soft as possible, I run the risk of losing a note. I want to play it as soft as possible without losing any notes, and I want them all to sound exactly the same dynamic. So I'm going to press them all down until I reach that little resting point. And then just do a very sudden play through this doing my repeated chord exercise. While I run through this exercise, I want to give some last tips, notes, and answer some questions. My biggest general practice tip is that when you practice, you are practicing everything you're doing. You're practicing your mistakes, your attitude, and most importantly, you're practicing what you pay attention to. When I find myself starting to repeat a mistake, which means I'm practicing the mistake, I'll often move to practicing where I move my mind as I play the notes beforehand. 
and if I get my mind movements wrong, I'll keep drilling that section even if my fingers played the notes perfectly. I'll practice thinking ahead to the next section, and if I mess up a note, it's usually not because I got that note wrong in that measure, but because I didn't put it in my mental cue the measure before, and that's what I need to practice. Now, onto a general note, which is that while I consider myself a fairly advanced amateur on the piano, there is a huge gap between me and a professional pianist, so don't listen too hard to me as a pianist. I'm calling this a masterclass from a composer angle, because I'm the composer, I'm the authority on this piece, and in general, I like to take a lot of liberties when I express other composers' piano music in ways that might trigger some snobbery in people who specialize in a particular composer or technique, but this is my piece, and I say you can play it however you want. You can change up all the phrasing and dynamics, do whatever you want with the drone. This is your chance to rubato your heart out, and no one can tell you you're wrong. To me, a piano piece is a pure mathematical object. A piano piece isn't sound waves, and it's not dots on paper, it's a thing that's an idea and a story and relationships and it has no physical existence so there's nothing you can do to harm it you can't ruin it you can't get it wrong you can't even play it you can only interpret it and represent it and use performance as a vehicle to better understand the abstract existence of the piece this is a way in which to me classical composition is different from modern music production which does exist in the medium of sound and I've done musical work where the artwork is in the MP3 with all its specific sound waves, but this Pi Day 2022 piece is the kind of abstract classical composition that exists in the platonic realm, forever unseen and forever unheard. In the Pi Day video, I took a kind of retrospective analytical approach to how I might have composed this piece, and that's how I interpreted the theory of this piece, looking at it now that it already exists. But make no mistake, I have no idea how I compose. I could work with the digits of pi easily because I know them, and this is what they wanted to do. The piece simply wants to be like this, it's as if it exists outside myself, and while logically I know I compose this, I don't feel like it is within my power to choose a single note of this piece. I mean, I could change a note in the sheet music, but that would only result in the sheet music being incorrect. Like, I wanted this piece to have a different ending, but giving it the wrong ending would actually compromise my integrity. I don't know how that's possible, but it's true. It really feels like I'm channeling this kind of stuff, and if I don't do it right, then it's my mistake. It's not my choice. Finally, I got some questions about the sheet music, mp3, and other purchasables that may or may not still be available depending on when you watch this. The sheet music and mp3 for this piece, which is called Pi Day 2022 and is dedicated to my patrons, is linked below. And if it's still March 2022, then you can still pre-order this year's Pi Day shirt design. After March, that's it for this shirt design. We're not going to keep them in stock. We might order some extra triangle pins, so if you're here after March 2022, still check out the merch link below. There could be something fun and shiny if you want to support this kind of video. I know it's not my usual, but I'm doing more composery stuff in my life, whether I share it or not. So I wanted to try out something more casual than my usual content on this channel, so here you go.
Good enough.